Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, good afternoon and our morning to our, those of you who are joining us from the West Coast. And thank you so much for joining us on our latest installment of the Homeroom with Hunt Leaders, with Education Leaders. Uh, we know you all have really busy schedules and there's so much going on in the world right now. And so we really appreciate you taking the time to, to think about equitable educational opportunities for all students. Um, I would also like to particularly thank our wonderful panelists, Superintendent Tony Thurmond of California, Director Colt Gill of Oregon, and Dr. Lynn Holden of the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Uh, we know there's so much work for all three of you to be doing at this moment, and so we really, truly appreciate you taking the time to, to have these important discussions. Uh, just a few quick housekeeping things before we get started. If you've missed any of our past conversations, you can find them on our website. Uh, this includes full video as well as blog recaps of each of our webinar, and they'll be posted within the week. Uh, after our welcoming remarks, we'll hear from our panelists for about 30 minutes, and then we'll pivot to a Q&A with the audience. If you have any questions throughout the discussion, please feel free to submit them using the Q&A feature. Uh, and be sure to include your name and title and organization that, so that we can give you proper credit. I just want to quickly note, since this is such a large webinar, we won't be unmuting lines. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that you're all aware and that you should be submitting questions through the Q&A uh, if you're to be asked. Uh, and then finally, quickly, uh, we'd love to hear from you on social media during our conversation today. So if you tweet about today's uh, episode, please use the hashtag edhomeroom. And um, you can also use that to follow along with other attendees. I'd now like us to get started by asking uh, the Hunt Institute's president and CEO, Dr. Javed Siddiqui, to provide some brief welcoming remarks. Over to you, Javed. Good afternoon. Thank you, Julia. Um, thanks to everyone for joining us today, and thank you to our uh, distinguished panel. I uh, appreciate you all making time. I know how busy you are during this time and appreciate you taking the opportunity to be with us, especially now as states and districts are working through what school may look like in the fall. As we all know, this year our teachers and other educators and school staff have stepped up to continue serving students in ways we certainly couldn't have imagined uh, just uh, several months back. So it's important for us to take time to openly and honestly discuss challenges schools and educators are facing as well as the potential strategies for best serving students and in, uh, in the coming school year. I want to thank we have hundreds of folks on online today. I want to thank all of the educators for joining us today uh, from certainly California, Oregon and, and uh, all over the country. Um, these, this homeroom series has really taken off and I appreciate our team's uh, leadership in bringing these voices together. Uh, so thank you for all that you're doing uh, as you prepare for what, whatever the school uh, year may look like, wherever your local context is, uh, know that Hunt Institute is, is thinking about you um, and, and thankful for you. So I actually just got off with a group of legislators on a previous Zoom. And so I know states and district leaders are working diligently to find the safest solutions for providing high quality, equitable access to education for all students. This is a, an incredibly complicated task, and so we're grateful to those of you who are developing creative, innovative solutions to serve our students, our, uh, support our teachers and staff, and keep our families uh, and all of our staff and the students safe during this challenging time. I venture to say there probably is not a good solution out there, uh, but and thankful for leaders like those joining us today for, um, and have entrusted to make this decision on all of our behalf. So thank you for being with us. I look forward to your reflections and thanks for all you do and that I'll turn it back over to Julia to get this great conversation going. Thanks so much, Javed. Um, I'd like to start by having us hear from Dr. Lynn Holden, who in addition to being the president and CEO of Mentoring in Medicine, is also a professor of emergency medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx um, and, and is also vice chair of diversity and inclusion for the Department of Emer Emergency Medicine there. Um, and so Dr. Holden, could you speak a bit from a national perspective about what state and school leaders are really thinking about as it relates to returning to school in the fall and, and what considerations are, are being made when thinking about the health and safety of students and staff? Absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for uh, having me. It's really an honor and a pleasure uh, to be able to uh, to address you and your audience. Uh, I come to you not only as a medical professional, but also as a public health advocate and as an educator myself. Uh, I think in the Bronx, I'm related in the Bronx, and so it was hit pretty early uh, with the surge of uh, COVID-19. And so we have gotten uh, quite a bit of experience uh, in dealing with COVID-19. And so I just wanted to, to talk to you about that. And also, as Julia said, 
from a national perspective, I think, you know, everyone is concerned about safety, uh, their health and safety. And so uh, we really have to focus on how we can maximize health and safety in light of this uh, new normal in order to make our students, our staff, and our families safe in order to go back to school. And we do want the students to learn. We want them to be educated and preferably in school, but it definitely has to be uh, safe. Let me talk a little bit about why uh, coronavirus and COVID-19 is very challenging. So as you know, coronavirus is actually a virus that causes this novel coronavirus because it's new and causes COVID-19 is the disease. The challenge is that we are still playing about this disease and the effects of the disease on various populations, children, adults, older adults, and on hey, those. Doctor, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Dr. Holden, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but no your, problem. Um, your audio is cutting in and out a bit, and so I was wondering if maybe um, we can send you a call in link and we can uh, have you call in and maybe the audio will be a little bit better. Absolutely. Okay, great. Sorry about that. We'll send you that, no uh, that info right yes. now, and uh, we'll we'll pick up where we left off. When we'll go over to our, our next speaker, and then pick, come back to you when you're back on. Does that sound good? Okay, great. Yes. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Superintendent Thurman. Sorry, everyone, about some of the technical difficulties here. Um, but Superintendent Thurman is the Superintendent of Public Instruction in California. And Superintendent, can you discuss how California, uh, what California is doing now and is thinking about doing long-term to really think about how to safely and equitably reopen schools? Uh, thank you, Julia. And if any reason, um, you know, my audio needs to be addressed, give me some kind of a sim uh, signal um, because we are living in an area where um, we're all experiencing the digital divide, certainly our students. And, uh, you know, right now we know there are many challenges. I want to say greetings to everyone who's joined today um, to this great panel. It's an honor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Siddiqui and others for the invitation. Uh, you know, simply put, I believe that this is the biggest challenge that most of us will experience in our lifetime. Uh, this pandemic uh, is nonstop. Its impacts are incredibly intense on every facet of our society and especially our schools and I commend the resilience of our students and our educators and their parents for the manners in which they literally moved into distance learning overnight um, in March when the pandemic began. Um, you know, things have continued to evolve in ways that I think require our constant monitoring and our constant efforts to be prepared and to be safe. Uh, you know, we a month ago, um, more than a month ago, our agency provided guidance on how schools will reopen. Um, it talked about how to keep class sizes small and how to arrange educators and how to arrange students to be safe. Even in that time, in little more than a month, we've seen cases uh, skyrocket in California and throughout this nation in ways that really call into question, how will we safely open our schools? And quite frankly, if the conditions that we're seeing right now um, you know, if today was the day to open school or tomorrow, I do not believe that we could open in most places in in-person instruction. Um, we have a few counties in our state that have very low rates of transmission uh, of COVID, and they have lots of space to spread out for students in school, and those counties will probably be able to open. But as we consult with our health officials and our Department of Public Health, um, We need for most of our plan to open in distance learning. We have more than a thousand school districts in California. They each make their own decisions at the local level. But what we've tried to do is provide statewide guidance in consultation with our governor's office and in consultation uh, with our legislature to make sure our schools have the resources they need uh, to open safely. In that respect, we've sent resources to more than 10,000 schools already, face masks, uh, face shields, hand sanitizer, you know, the units, the amounts of the units are incredible, but we know that now is a time for monitoring and making sure our students are safe. I think it's gotta be the three pillars. Can we provide safety? That's gotta be, um, nothing can be negotiated. It's gotta be safe or it's not. Um, we have to address the social emotional learning uh, needs of our students. Students are gonna need counseling. We know that during the pandemic, they've had high rates of depression and suicide. I've created a kind of task force and counseling coalition that mobilizes our, all of our counseling groups 
to really provide support to our students, many of whom we didn't check in during school, many of whom have questions and fears because of the pandemic, to provide additional support to our students. And so right now we are making the move to help our districts with consulting with all of our county health officers and uh, our state department of public health to help our districts answer the question about how do we keep kids safe during the pandemic. Mind you, all the while, while we continue to deal with the aftermath of you know, the killing of George Floyd, let's face it, this has created a traumatic experience for everyone in our country to witness such a horrific um, event and to know that our students have witnessed that they've been traumatized. And so we've announced a campaign to promote uh, training around implicit bias in all of our 10,000 schools. So we have conversations about dealing with race and racism and bias so that our students can be supported, so our educators can be supported. And so, uh, Julia, we're happy to answer questions about all the things that we're doing in California. Our, our safety focus is our top priority. We can give you updates on a county by county basis. Uh, but what we know right now is that if the conditions that we see today are going to be in place when schools open, we know that the majority of our schools will open in a way that provides distance learning. And by the way, we're providing advanced guidance to our schools about how to make sure that distance learning and remote learning, that there's consistency across classroom to classroom, that we can address inequities that sometimes exist for families who don't have computers uh, or who have other challenges. I've created a task force on closing the digital divide because we found that in California, we've had a digital divide for uh, decades that mean a million students don't have internet. And so for those who are watching today and wondering how can I get involved in California or in Oregon or any other state, um, we want you to go to donate tech at cde.ca.gov and know that we're working to make sure every single one of our students has a computer, has access to a teacher, has access to counseling, and can be safe as we prepare to open school in the fall. Thank you so much, Superintendent Thurman, and, and thank you for everything that you're doing in California. Uh, and next we have Dr. Col Colt Gale, who's the director of the Oregon Department of Education. And Director, can you talk a bit about how Oregon is like California approaching this question both now and in the long term to think about these questions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks again for the invitation uh, to the Hunt Institute and I appreciated hearing from Superintendent Thurmond and look forward to hearing the rest of um, Dr. Holden's um, opening remarks because uh, the more that I hear from the uh, medical field and our healthcare field, uh, the better prepared I, um, I feel like we are to open our schools and and to think about what education needs to look like this year. You know, I, I agree with everything Superintendent Thurman said. I think from classroom teacher on through state level leadership, we are all navigating and trying to lead um, through something that we, we don't have experience with in this generation, leading through a global pandemic, leading through a nationwide um, reckoning around current and um, past racism and the impacts of racism in our country. Uh, makes this a very challenging time and, and one where um, it's all the more important that we come through for our students. We also released our uh, guidance initially the same week that California and Washington released theirs. Um, so we released it on June 10th and we released it knowing and naming at that time that we would be iterating that guidance throughout the summer and on three week cycles um, we have sent out updates. The next one coming out Tuesday next week. Um, and we've needed to, much like California, um, when we put out our guidance on June 10th, uh, Oregon was experiencing a plateau of about 12 weeks of 50 to 70 um, cases a day of COVID-19 in our, in our state. And now we're experiencing upwards of um, 400 and 500, which for Oregon is, is significant, not quite what California is going through, but still um, gives us pause and um, has us rethinking which of the models our schools will open under. Uh, our guidance centers on four guiding principles. The first is to ensure safety and wellness. Um, we know that the decision to return to school settings must be driven by health and safety considerations first. And in planning, we're asking that our schools prioritize uh, basic needs such as food, shelter, wellness, and create conditions to support mental, social, and emotional health of both students and staff. Um, second, uh, cultivate connection and relationship. Uh, we felt like this is something we attempted to do this spring uh, when our schools closed statewide, but, but we know it's imperative because quality learning experiences require deep interpersonal relationships 
and learning environments where people are seen, known, and loved. Um, I'll come back to this one, but our third one is centering on equity. In Oregon, all of our race and ethnic groups are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 when compared to their white peers. And we're asking our schools to recognize that disproportionate harm and the impact of it and apply an equity-informed, anti-racist, anti-oppressive lens to promote a culturally sustaining and revitalizing education system that actually supports every child. And again, I'll touch back on that in a minute. Um, fourth and final one is innovation. Uh, we know that we're operating under complex circumstances, like I shared, in which learning is currently situated and requires a lot of ongoing reflection and iteration to assure that we can actually come through with learning for every student. All the public and private schools in Oregon under this guidance uh, will select from three instructional models. So they, they, we do have some communities um, that are not experiencing COVID-19 outbreaks that will open in person every day with every student attending. Um, they will have significant health provisions in place around physical distancing, hygiene, face coverings, all those things that have begun to become normalized for many of us. Um, the schools can also choose uh, to open under comprehensive distance learning, which is a, a new and updated model with more rigor um, than what we were able to apply overnight this, um, this spring, uh, where really every teacher in Oregon and much so across the nation became a first year teacher as they tried to implement in an entirely new um, environment. So um, comprehensive distance of learning in Oregon is primarily offsite instruction with daily synchronous um, contact between students and educators and where they access standards-based grade level content instruction and assessment. Um, they can also implement a hybrid model uh, that includes some on-site and some online learning. Multiple factors will inform each community and each school's decision around which instructional model they select. Um, those definitely include local COVID-19 status, um, healthcare readiness in the community, the school facility capacity, the staffing capacity, the needs of high-risk students and staff, and other factors that they're collecting through input with students, family, families, and community members. Um, at this time, uh, we are establishing, and Governor Brown has been very clear that it's critical to reinforce equity at the center of our work not as a separate endeavor or removed from a holistic view. Um, all levels of education system in Oregon uh, must collaborate together on solutions and strategies and supports uh, for long-term success and well-being. To live into an equity stance, um, we believe Oregon schools must heighten attention uh, to groups of students who have bared the burden of an inequitable health and education system over time. And throughout all of this work, our educators uh, need to recognize the strengths and the needs of our students of color. This includes for us um, specifically our African American and Black students, Alaska Native and American Indian students, um, Asian Pacific Island students, um, immigrants and refugees, our Latina, Latino, and Latinx students, our Compact of Free Association citizens our students who are emerging bilinguals, our students of migrant families and farm worker families, students experiencing disabilities, our students who are LGBTQ 2SIA+, our students in foster care, students who have, been have a loved one who's been incarcerated, and our students um, who are experiencing houselessness or navigating poverty. It's not enough for us to make these statements. Our guidance uh, provides schools with 22 specific requirements and recommendations um, with equity, racial equity, and anti-racist approaches um, that focus on recognizing strength and resilience of our communities and families in times of adversity um, and recognizing that meaningful reciprocal relationships are essential for learning and well-being and that all of our students benefit from a culturally responsive and sustaining um, instructional program. Finally, our guidance provides an equity-centered decision tree that's a tool along with various other facilitation tools to help our schools and communities navigate um, these decisions and these um, community conversations with equity at the core. Thank you.
thank you so much, Director Gill, and, and thank you for your your thoughtfulness. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time to to list all of those different student groups that we need to be thinking about. Um, uh, Dr. Holden, welcome back. Um, <laughs> uh, and I would like to give you a, a couple minutes to finish your remarks and, and keep talking about uh, what what medical professionals are really thinking about when it comes to school safety. Absolutely. Is it, is it sound better now? Yes, okay, excellent, excellent. So uh, just to uh, continue my remarks, and I apologize um, for that gap. Uh, so again, I come to you as a medical doctor. I come to you as also uh, a public health advocate and also as an educator. And the challenge, I, I'm tuning in from the Bronx, and as you know, the Bronx had an early surge uh, with coronavirus and with COVID-19, which we have uh, been able to control uh, through known factors to mitigate uh, the spread. And as you know, the surge has been spreading across the country, uh, now in the South and in California. So we learned a lot of lessons here in the Bronx, and um, we definitely um, have well, unfortunately, we have lost many lives, uh, most of those lives being people of color who do have health inequities. Uh, we have learned a lot of lessons. And so my concern is that we share those lessons, especially with educators, uh, when it comes to uh, keeping the educators, the community, and the students safe uh, when they go back to school. So let me just share a couple of uh, challenges with uh, COVID-19. COVID-19 is actually caused by a virus uh, called the novel coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this is the name of the virus that causes COVID. The virus is spread, and again, we're still figuring out um, really extensively about this virus, uh, how it spread. Uh, we still do not have a cure. We still do not have a vaccine, uh, but we have learned a lot uh, so far. So one example is we've learned how it spreads. It spreads basically in three ways. The first way is through respiratory droplets. Uh, so if someone speaks, coughs, or sneezes, and they are uh, infected, then they can infect uh, someone else. Hence, we're asking uh, for citizens to wear masks because those masks cut down on the number of particles that are emitted uh, when someone speaks sneezes or coughs if they are infected. The second way, uh, and the uh, virus itself is spread because someone inhales those droplets, uh, inhales the virus, and then it starts acting on the molecular level to infect, uh, infect that host. The second way it spread is by what we call fomite. So that means if someone coughs, sneezes, or speaks and they're infected, those droplets can actually latch on to wood, for example, to uh, plastic, for example, to surfaces, and someone can touch those surfaces and then touch their eyes, their nose, and their mouth and become infected with the coronavirus. So this has implications because if someone were to sneeze, for example, and some of the particles got on the floor, then someone can actually carry this virus on the bottom of their shoe home. So we have to be mindful of all the touch points uh, where this virus can be spread. And finally, the virus um, studies are being done that it could be spread through uh, fecal or for, for, uh, through stool, uh, through the gastrointestinal tract. So again, as medical professionals, we're getting knowledge every day, um, multiple times a day, uh, new knowledge about, uh, about this virus. So the question becomes, how do we safely open schools? And number one is by educating and training all of those who will be uh, participating in the education of the students, especially those who are, who are particularly vulnerable, those who are older, uh, for example, those who have pre-existing diseases. Next, we have to make sure that everyone has the proper equipment to protect themselves. Masks, for example, perhaps eye shields, uh, definitely uh, uh, sink with running water and soap, uh, hand sanitizer, so there are ways that we know that we can reduce the spread of the virus, but we have to educate everyone on how to do that. And ed everyone has to do their part to participate uh, in this activity to keep everyone safe. Um, so 
so the last thing is social distancing. I'd like to say physical distancing. Um, so a lot of schools do not have space to physical, uh, to distance physically. Uh, we know that that uh, decreases the spread of the virus. And let me just bring up one point. Um, the whole mental, um, emotional, and social aspect of this virus has been affecting uh, children in many ways. If they do not know someone that was affected by the virus or they were affected themselves, they're hearing about it on the news. They're hearing about it and seeing it on social media. So this, in effect, they're constantly being bombarded with negative images uh, of this virus and not all of them are uh, from reliable sources. So we definitely have to educate uh, the public about the virus. We have to, as much as we can, enforce uh, what we know will help decrease uh, the spread of the virus. And we have to make sure that our schools are equipped um, through sanitation, through uh, protective equipment in order to receive students in a safe manner. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Holden. Um, and we're gonna move into Q&A now. I see we've gotten some questions uh, chatted in, so I really appreciate all of you being so engaged there. Uh, if you have other questions, please feel free to chat them in. We'll try to get through as many as possible. Um, but uh, if not, we will hopefully find a way to, uh, to follow up on those questions soon. Um, so I'll start first uh, with Dr. Holden, just briefly. Um, many of the changes, cautions that we've been discussing, uh, both as it relates to health and safety and academics, uh, as you mentioned, require new knowledge and expectations. Um, and, and we really need to be thinking about how we train people on, uh, on what school will look like. And so what are some ways that, what are some really tangible policies that states and districts and schools can use to support teachers and staff uh, when, in the event that they go back into the school building? Uh, that's an outstanding question. Uh, so training, training, training. Uh, so there has to be uh, extensive training of all parties about uh, coronavirus and about what we know, how we can mitigate the spread of the virus. And that can be done uh, virtually. We've actually started that through mentoring and medicine of some of our partners. Um, and we are very concerned that um, there are fallacies that are uh, going around about uh, COVID-19, especially when it comes to uh, cures. Um, so we need to make sure that um, we use reliable resources, provide them uh, for everyone involved, and we uh, engage in, in training and hopefully, uh, as I said before, all of the citizens will uh, do their part to, uh, for example, wear a mask because we know that almost 30,000 lives can be saved in eight weeks by just wearing a mask. Uh, so we need to make sure that we reinforce uh, those behaviors, those new, quote unquote, of this new normal that we're in uh, with this pandemic, but that we reinforce those behaviors to keep everybody safe. Thank you. Um, and then moving on to a kind of a, a different measure of health, Superintendent Thurmond, um, you, you and Dr. Gill uh, both discussed, if students are returning to school buildings, they'll have been out of the classroom for months, many of them with limited social interaction, and, and a lot of them having experienced great trauma. Uh, what are social and emotional supports that states and districts can put into place uh, to address these needs? You know, we are working, as I mentioned, with our um, a lot of our counseling coalitions. We have nonprofits and partners. We have an association of school counselors and psychologists. We're asking them to kind of form a kind of a, a you know a, a, a quilt of support to fill gaps. You know, a lot of our groups that provide social emotional learning were not able to work directly with our students during the pandemic. They also weren't able to get the kind of funding that they normally get from sources like Medi-Cal that help them to provide school-based health and mental health services. And so that put a lot of our own institutions at risk of closing their doors. So we've had to build the kind of patchwork quilt of support to make sure that our students continue to get support. And that's where we've made uh, our, our focus. You know, students miss their teachers and their educators quite a bit. When, um, you know, during the pandemic, it's important, you know, Director Gill talked about the importance of synchronous instruction. Just seeing your teacher uh, does a world of good for our students. We know that they don't need to be on a computer for eight hours a day, but they need to be able to see their educators. They need to be able to see their paraeducators who support students with disabilities, those 
one-on-one -on -one support staff, those relationships are so crucial. And so again, we're trying to make sure we layer all of those relationships, contact with your teacher and, and your support staff, access to uh, mental health professionals, uh, in many cases, in almost every case, providing telehealth sessions. Um, and, real, and really acknowledging a lot of our families without computers, how do they get access to this? And we've really been on an aggressive campaign to get computer donations, both to support academic needs of our students and to support the social emotional learning needs of our students who need a computing device to be able to engage with a mental health professional for their support. Thank you. Um, and Director Gill, the, the need for physical distancing is, as well as the reality that some students and staff may not feel safe entering a school building in the fall has made it so that there will uh, likely be a demand for both on-site and virtual school. Um, how is Oregon thinking about this? Yeah, thank you. Um, that, that is true for Oregon. You know, Oregon's home to 197 school districts with around a dozen of those serving more than 10,000 students and around a dozen of them serving fewer than 10 students. So I always like to share that metric because it just shows um, how unique um, and individual our school districts are in our state. They each have their own strengths and needs and they each have their own experience with COVID-19. And so um, as one of the things I also do is I receive a lot of email as, as I'm sure Superintendent Thurmond and other state leaders are right now, um, you know, imploring us to either come back full time um, and, and have in-person instruction with no masks, no physical distancing, um, kind of a plea to return to life as normal um, that we experienced four or five months ago. And I received the same amount of email or more that says it's clearly not safe to come back to into our buildings right now. Um, we know that our schools will be making that decision at the local level. They'll be basing it on um, what I talked about earlier, COVID-19 rates and healthcare system readiness and their ability to implement our, our standards that um, Dr. Holden has talked about, about what you need to do to keep um, both students and staff safe while they're in the building. But we will have some family members and some students whose families will decide um, it's not safe enough yet for me. So even if a school is offering in person, they'll say that I'm not ready to send my child to school. We are asking each of our school districts to be prepared to provide a form of distance learning um, for students who choose not to return. You know, those students may be choosing that because they are themselves um, a member of a high risk category, um, or they may have family members that they go to home to that are older or part of a high risk category. And in order to keep that family safe, that's what they want to do. Um, this will be one of our greatest uh, challenges in terms of shifting our resources. It's very difficult to run school both on site and online with the same staffing levels uh, that we were that we were running before. Um, we're also burdened in Oregon with an incomplete infrastructure, with parts of our state still needing broadband access. Um, that that's very challenging for us. We are aiming significant portions of both our federal coronavirus relief funds and our CARES Act dollars toward connectivity, purchasing of devices for both students and staff, um, and professional learning for our educators and technical support for our families in multiple languages. So that, um, that's the way that we're driving at that. The, the other piece I would add is that our legislature is coming into session in the next couple of weeks to determine school funding for the coming year. Um, and they have been uh, making very strong statements about around their support for education. We will be seeking their additional support uh, for online learning readiness in our state. Um, because we know um, Dr. Thurman talked about the digital divide it, and it shows up in some of the questions we're receiving. It's very real and, and we need to be able to provide access to every student. Thank you so much. Um, and we're going to switch now um, to back to Superintendent Thurmond. Um, and this one comes from Gary Casasa, uh, a paraeducator at Terra Hilla Elementary School um, in, for the West Contra uh, Costa Unified School District. Um, and he was wondering, what are some measures that you're considering to help medically fragile students right now? Um, you know, what are those really tangible measures that are going to support, support those students? 
Well, I want to thank Gary for your service at Terra Hills Elementary. I know that school quite well, um, having had the honor of serving on the school board for uh, the West Contra Costa Unified School District. I'm grateful for what you all do for almost 40,000 students in that district. And uh, while, uh, while my focus is statewide, um, you know, I continue to think about West Contra Costa as a very special district. I'm also a parent of that district. And, uh, you know, for medically fragile students, obviously there are many options, including distance learning. The district, West Contra Costa has already announced that it's gonna open the school year in a kind of remote learning environment for all students, and then continue to monitor the conditions. And as it appears safe to do so, will open for more students to enter the campus. And so that's an individual conversation for that family, uh, for every family. And obviously we'd be happy to help if we can in connecting with the officials at West Contra Costa. Um, but right now, the entire school district is planning to open in August in distance learning to promote safety for all students. Thank you so much. Um, and then I'd like our next question, uh, for this one to be for Director Gill, just because this is something that you spoke so, um, so profoundly about in your opening remarks. But uh, you know, there's such a concern around equitably reopening school school buildings and um, and making sure that we're really serving all students. Um, and so, how are leaders really working? Uh, just not in not just in Oregon, but nationwide, um, working to ensure that they're connecting with and assessing the needs of all families um, in order to make these decisions, and and not just those who are easiest to reach. Um, that's that's a good question. So. I'm, I'm going to share, I don't know, I'm going to be really clear, nationwide, I don't know the approach that um, everyone is taking. I know that um, along the West Coast, we have regular meetings among the state leadership in California, Oregon, and oftentimes um, British Columbia from Canada. And we have all named this as, a, as an important issue. In our state, um, which, I, which I can speak most directly to, um, we are trying to do a lot to include voice in the development of our guidance from the beginning. Um, and then our guidance calls for districts to reach out and include community partners um, who sometimes have better access and more trusted um, relationships with uh, families and communities of colors um, in our school districts than the school district might. Uh, um, to help bring everyone together into the conversations about uh, providing the kinds of resources and supports that are needed to ensure we're meeting not only the education needs, but the social emotional health needs of our students. Um, so for Oregon in the development of our guidance, uh, we connected with about 8,000 Oregonians via a survey and another 3,000 in Zoom meetings like this that were interactive where they were looking through parts of our guidance and giving input to um, what that should look like um, to ensure that it was practical. Um, we held meetings with our um, uh, Oregon Education Association, our, our union leaders, um, and they brought in uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of teachers in meetings over time, um, again, to help inform our guidance. So I think that uh, this kind of outreach is, is what's critical, um, both at the local district level and at the state level. Um, our governor, Governor Kate Brown, has just started a Healthy Schools Reopening Council um, that is inclusive of the voice of students on the council, um, educators, the healthcare community, um, and many of our elected officials and community-based partners, um, focusing on, on culturally specific community-based partner organizations around the state. Um, and, and they are driving uh, the future iteration and changes to our guidance through the summer and into the fall. Um, so we really look forward to their input. Thank you so much. Um, and Dr. Holden, we know that there's a, a very high possibility that uh, in different school districts that a, a parent or a student is going to test positive for, for COVID-19. Um, so what sort of guidance should uh, schools be giving or should states be giving uh, in handling these scenarios? Thank you very much. So. Um, that is a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, some of our students are actually unable uh, to, and some of our families are unable to uh, quarantine uh, themselves because they don't have uh, the wherewithal. Uh, they may not live in a, a large apartment. We suffer, we have multi-generational uh, living, especially among persons of color. 
So it's important to, first of all, be able to, uh, for everyone to recognize potential symptoms of uh, COVID-19. Uh, and that's a challenge because almost 40% of those who have the virus actually are asymptomatic. They show no symptoms. However, they can still spread the virus. So that's another challenge that we are facing as, uh, as a, a nation. Uh, when it comes to uh, COVID-19. However, once someone shows uh, any symptoms that they're concerned about, and those could range from loss of taste to smell, to uh, cough, shortness of breath, uh, chest pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, congestion, all of these are uh, symptoms uh, of COVID-19, then they should be tested. Um, and that comes into question, uh, not only the availability uh, of testing, um, but also the turnaround time for tests. So once someone is concerned that they display symptoms, they should seek out health care. Uh, again, a lot of places are having telehealth and some communities don't have access to telehealth. Uh, but emergency departments are open. Uh, they may be crowded, but they are open 24 seven, urgent cares and of course, uh, primary doctors uh, are available to assess the patient. But testing is very important and the results of the test. However, even before the results of the test are, or even the test it itself is done, uh, anyone who thinks they may be infected should quarantine themselves. What does that mean? That they should stay isolated from the rest of the family if possible. If that's not possible, they should wear a mask at all times to again, decrease the amount of uh, virus that they are potentially uh, emitting into the air for others to uh, to breathe. They should have a separate bathroom if possible, separate dishes uh, if possible, and others in the household should be very mindful of disinfecting uh, any surfaces that that person has contact with uh, or is touching. And these are just some of the ways that uh, one can reduce the amount of exposure to coronavirus amongst ones that they live with or they have close contact with. Thank you. And um, this is, I'm going to direct to uh, Dr. Gill. Um, how is Oregon, you know, kind of switching back a little bit to, um, to education, uh, how is Oregon being supported in learning new technologies, uh, or excuse me, Oregon teachers being supported in learning new technologies for the online classroom? And, you know, what kind of professional development can they expect to be offered throughout the year? Um, I think, you know, this really um, harkens back to what happened this spring when we all dramatically shifted uh, to closing our buildings to in-person instruction. And our teachers, um, in many, many cases across the state, were left to their, their own devices um, to figure out how to connect with our students. I spoke um, yesterday to one of the um, superintendents in one of our large districts who shared concerns that families and students and parents came to him with, where a student who had you know, six teachers in high school each one of them or nearly each one of them using a different platform to try to connect with the student. Um, and it became very, very confusing and challenging for the student to stay engaged um, and work through and earn their credits towards graduation. This year, um, we have new guidance that's being put out. It's um, comprehensive distance learning guidance. It does require all districts to uh, settle on a single platform um, so that their, um, each teacher um, has access to that. All students and families know what to expect. And it also calls for additional um, professional learning for the educators um, so that they can feel like they, they um, are able to use those tools effectively um, to uh, deliver instruction uh, electronically. Now, there will be challenges to this, um, both in terms of time um, and in terms of financing that, that work. Uh, we have, we're adjusting our instructional time rules to allow for more professional learning time for educators um, so that we can ensure the time that they are with students really counts and matters. Um, and then second, uh, I mentioned this earlier when I, when I answered a previous question, but we're using some of our CARES Act funds, um, both the, uh, the elementary and secondary emergency education funds um, and the governor's education, emergency education relief funds. Um, to uh, deliver grants to school districts and education service districts um, to provide professional learning and devices and connectivity. Um, so we're hoping uh, 
to be able to really soon about a $30 million investment um, across the state in those professional learning efforts. Um, we'll also look to our education service districts who have been leaders in our state in helping to support professional learning um, and, and partnering with them and trying to come through with the resources they need to support teachers and their learning in this area. Thank you. Um, and Superintendent Thurmond, uh, we had a really interesting question sent in before, uh, excuse me, before the webinar started. Um, the current challenge, it really presents a great opportunity for uh, more collaboration and connection between early childhood and the K-12 system, especially with um, childcare being such a concern right now um, for, for parents who are still in the workforce. Uh, how, have, how has California looked to increase this collaboration uh, to support the needs of families right now? You know, as we, uh, before we entered the summer period, we found ourselves spending a lot of time trying to support our early education programs. Many of our child care centers stayed open to provide child care for the parents of essential workers. And so these became really our learning opportunities because we actually had schools that were open during the pandemic. And so when we released our guidance for our 10,000 schools on how to reopen, we actually featured a few of our uh, child care and preschool programs to share their experience. Obviously, their ages weren't the same as our entire you know, pre-K through 12th grade uh, range, but they had experiences with trying to get young people to keep a facial covering on, um, with trying to um, maintain physical distancing, making sure that people, you know, in their case, that students were eating their meal at their desk, not in an open cafeteria or things of that nature. We learned a lot from our early education programs. They repurposed every part of their campus so that we wouldn't have large groups of people in a, in a rec room or a lunch room. Um, and, and, and so what they did is they actually, you, you know, our weather's pretty good right now in California, and so is Oregon, and you know, we, you know, they took advantage of the ability for outdoor um, activities, um, education at tables and, uh, and chairs and desks outside to broaden the footprint of the campus. This is important in California because we know um, many of our schools are impacted for space as it is. And for us to get to a place where schools can have, you know, we've recommended six feet of, of physical distancing um, in our schools. Um, in order to have that, we have to utilize every aspect of the campus. So what that has taught us is what we're now seeing from many of our, our, our larger school districts. As they plan for reopening, they listen to the experience of our, of our child care programs that, that said, hey, you know, use the outdoor, use all spaces. Some of our bigger campuses now, they've said the way we're going to maintain physical distancing is we're going to partner with local community centers or a community college uh, that's nearby to use space that allows us to make the footprint of our campus bigger. The challenge is that means you have to have more staff, either substitute teachers or classified staff or others who can work with students to help expand um, the, 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 the footprint of the campus. And as, as Director Gill said, our budgets have been hindered by, you know, in California, our budget comes straight from sales tax revenue, um, income tax revenue. And so when the pandemic hits as hard as it has hit our nation's economy, um, all of our revenue has just been decimated. Uh, we, and so anyway, we're cobbling together what we have, but that also means using nearby centers to expand the footprint of the campus to maintain physical distance, as Dr. Holden has said. And that has, uh, you know, that's a lesson that started with just hearing from our, our child care centers, um, the way that they were able to put face coverings, hand washing, hand sanitizing, maintaining social distance. Oh, by the way, and temperature checks. All of our child care centers taught us a best practice um, that, that many of our schools are planning to do in reopening. And that is temperature checks at the school before students and staff enter. But they also ask parents to take the temperature of their child before they come to school. And if your child has a temperature or has any conditions that suggest illness of any kind, keep the child home so that we can prevent having to exclude them uh, and potentially the exposure um, to, uh, to, to uh, other students and staff at the school. Dr. Holden, I hope, I, get, I hope I'm getting that right. I'm not trying to get into your lane, but I'm listening to what you're saying. Thank you for the thumbs up, Dr. Holden. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's great. Actually, that transitions perfectly into my next question for for Dr. Holden. <laughs> I'm, I'm here for you. I, I'm here to make the handoff. 
so um, we've heard a lot of conflicting reports, I think, about how COVID-19 impacts children and, you know, uh, and what, what effect it has and how uh, asymptomatic they are or uh, how much they transmit it between different parties. Uh, what can you tell us about how COVID-19 impacts children and, and what this might mean for schools? Sure. Uh, again, Julia, we're, we're learning more and more about uh, COVID-19 as, as time goes on. Uh, we have found uh, over the past, really, six weeks that uh, children are affected by uh, COVID-19. And we have found that uh, some of them can be severely affected by COVID-19. Uh, children, especially under the age of uh, 12, are less affected, but they are still affected. So we have to be mindful, again, that, students, that people can have uh, COVID-19 and have no symptoms. Uh, so we have to always be mindful, and as an emergency medicine physician, anyone that comes into the emergency department has COVID-19 until proven otherwise. So we have to protect ourselves. And um, educators, um, anyone in the community uh, has to really uh, pay attention to, to the science, <laughs> basically to, uh, to what we do know about how to decrease uh, the spread of coronavirus uh, that causes COVID-19 because that's the way that we can uh, prevent uh, any sort of uh, problems from happening. Now, about six weeks ago, six to eight weeks ago, uh, there were reports of something called uh, multi-system inflammatory response. And that was, um, that seems to be the extreme uh, of what COVID-19 can do in uh, young children. Uh, that can be actually up into about 24 years old. So that, that can be very severe, but again, um, that is rare right now, but case reports have been um, noted across the country. But I, I just can't emphasize enough that, um, you know, we, we, you just don't know who has um, COVID-19. 40% of the people who have it do not have any symptoms, yet they are out walking around amongst us. So we have to assume that everyone potentially has it, and we have to do what we know, what scientists have said, and we can't repeat it enough, the mask wearing, and may I say wearing masks correctly. So that means covering the nose and covering the mouth. Wearing a mask with the nose out really defeats the purpose, or wearing a mask down here defeats the purpose. So you really have to wear a mask correctly in order for it to be effective. Number two, making sure that you wash your hands frequently. And you can't just wash your hands quickly. You have to really thoroughly, 20 seconds, soap and water, wash your hands, or use hand sanitizer that has at least 60% alcohol. And then physically distancing, making sure that uh, you are uh, at least six feet apart uh, from everyone. And that was because when someone coughs or sneezes or speaks, that has on average been the length that uh, particles that come spewing out of the mouth that we can only see through electron microscopy uh, travel. However, we have to be mindful of uh, surfaces that we touch. And that's why hand washing is so important because even touching the elevator button to go to the second or third floor, you could potentially be picking up coronavirus and then you touch your mouth, your hand, your cell phone. Uh, these are ways that, that coronavirus spreads. So all of this, um, all of the ways that we are certain that coronavirus spreads, we must educate each other and we must hold each other accountable for protecting not only ourselves, but our community. Thank you so much, Dr. Holden. And I, I think that's actually a really great spot for us to wrap up for today. Um, I think it's, you know, we all need those reminders. Uh, I think we all we all get a little bored and antsy in, in our quarantine sometimes and we need to be reminded of uh, how diligent we all need to be. So thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you again to, to you, Dr. Holden and Director Gill and Superintendent Thurmond uh, for joining us today, as well as all of you here on this webinar. This has been really informative and I, I think this has been a really great example of some of the tangible solutions that we can be thinking about for next year. So I hope the rest of you feel sim similarly. I'm really sorry if we weren't able to get to your questions today. Uh, we had uh, so many questions chatted in. It was really great to see. Um, but please feel free to tweet us, tweet at us at the Hunt underscore Institute with the hashtag Ed Homeroom, and we'll be sure to follow up. Um, we're also exploring ways next week of. Um, of a Twitter platform where we can uh, display this more widely and we'll, we'll be in touch with more information about that soon. 
Um, we'll post a recording of this presentation as well as key takeaways on our Hunt Institute blog later next week. Please check back for that. Please feel free to share it with your networks as well as any of our webinar opportunities. Um, additionally, the Hunt Institute has been working so hard over this time to compile as many resources and, and learning opportunities as possible. Uh, so we've created all of these on our uh, COVID resources landing page, which you can see here, the link there. Uh, as well as some of these other webinar opportunities. Um, next Thursday, July 21st, uh, we'll have an early childhood webinar with the, excuse me, Tuesday, July 1st, uh, we'll have an early childhood webinar uh, with Saul Dance Charitable Foundation, the Buffett Early Childhood Fund, and the Robbins Foundation. Um, next Thursday, July 23rd, um, we'll be hearing from the Lieutenant Governors of Wisconsin and Iowa. Um, and then introducing our new, newest webinar series on race and education. On, Tuesday, July 28th, we'll be having representatives from the American Indian Graduate Center, uh, My Brother's Keepers Alliance, and the Latino Community Foundation. Um, and once the webinar is over, you'll be brought to a quick survey asking you about your experience today. Um, we appreciate you filling that out uh, briefly. All responses will be kept totally confidential. Um, and then one last thing, uh, if you want any information about the Homeroom webinar series, please feel free to use this link here, um, on Institute slash homeroom, uh, as well as all of our upcoming webinars are on this page, huntinstitute.org slash upcoming webinars. So please feel free to use those. Um, thank you again to all of our panelists for joining us. Uh, this was a really great conversation and we are looking forward to seeing you at our next webinar on July 21st. Thank you so much. Have a great day.